and welcome everybody to the American Philosophical Society's public lectures. My name is Patrick Spiro and I'm the librarian of the American Philosophical Society. And today we have a very special talk to mark a very special day. This Sunday, which for many of us will be Easter, also marks 232 years ago, the day that Benjamin Franklin died at the age of 84. Now, I don't know, I don't need to go into a lot of detail for many of the viewers about what Franklin accomplished in his life. It's fair to say that Franklin certainly lived up to a piece of poor Richard's advice. Either write something worth reading or do something worth writing. And Franklin certainly did both. But I do briefly want to talk about the APS and Franklin. As I'm sure many of our viewers uh, know, the American Philosophical Society would not be what it is today had it not been for Franklin's dedication to this institution. Franklin, with a group of other civically minded Philadelphians, helped found the APS in 1743. He did so because he wanted to connect leading thinkers with each other to produce new knowledge and disseminate it throughout the world to improve mankind. He contributed to society in a myriad of ways. He published important articles in our transactions. He helped raise money for Philosophical Hall and he contributed his own money to fund it. He supported research and he built connections with scientists throughout the United States and Europe. He also served as the society's first president, a position he held until his death. When he died, he bequeathed a collection of books to the APS, and later, through a series of donations, many of his papers and belongings came to the American Philosophical Society, including his library chair, Leiden jars, in which he conducted electrical experiments, and a gift from King Louis XVI that was appraised as his mo the most valuable object that he owned at the time of his death. In many ways, the APS continues to stewards Franklin's legacy. And our book talk tonight is also a book launch and it could be more fitting for this event. Michael Meyer, a professor of journalism at the University of Pittsburgh has published Benjamin Franklin's Last Bet, The Favorite Founders, Divisive Death, Enduring Afterlife, and The Blueprint for American Prosperity. Um, this is a fascinating book. I just spent uh, the past few days reading it and it documents Benjamin Franklin's final experiment, a 200 year experiment. In his will, Franklin made a bequest to both Philadelphia and Boston in which each city was supposed to use his funds to, better, uh, to, to provide more opportunity for um, ambitious young people in both of these cities. And in 200 years, he hoped that these funds would produce a massive windfall for each city. That at least was his plan. But as Michael Meyer shows us, and to use an aphorism that is not one of poor Richards, the best laid plans of mice and men often go awry. That's Robert Burns. Um, and Michael is gonna take us on this journey tonight. And before we turn it over to him, I just wanna say that this is an incredibly uh, important book. Uh, you know, I often wonder, is there anything new to say about Franklin? I'm kind of immersed in it, so it may be my perspective, but I have to say this provided a totally new perspective on Franklin. It was a question that many of us probably had and didn't know the answer to, but Michael Meyer provides that answer and does so in a book that is just a page turner, is so well written. You can see his background in journalism and is so deeply researched. Uh, he conducted massive research at the Library of Congress in Philadelphia and in Boston and in other places around the world. Um, so with that, uh, any, without any further ado, I'm gonna turn things over to Michael. He's gonna talk for about 40 minutes and then we're gonna open it up to question and answers afterwards. And during the uh, asking questions at any point during this uh, talk uh, through the Q&A feature, and we will try and answer as many questions as we can in about 40 minutes. Michael? Thank you so much, Patrick. What a fantastic <laughs> introduction. I, I don't really have much more to say on top of all that, but I sure am honored to be here. This is a fantastic venue and the most fitting venue in which to launch this book today. And to talk about this remarkable afterlife of this person I think we all admire, or at least are curious about, fascinated by, and I'm going to say, you know, I'm gonna admit at the very beginning, before I started working on this book, I never really thought about Benjamin Franklin that much. Um, I think to me, he was the guy on the $100 bill, he was, you know, maybe like an American Yoda sort of figure that he was this wizened older gentleman who would have funny, you know, pithy sayings that he would drop in every now and then, like fish and visitors stink in three days and so forth. But it wasn't until um, I was invited to this, this is a, a shot of our State Department's interior. I was invited when I came back from China, I was a 
one of the first Peace Corps volunteers and had worked as a journalist in China for many years and wrote books about China. And when then Chinese President Hu Jintao was visiting DC for his state dinner, I, as a mere writer, was just invited to the state luncheon. And I walked into the State Department and there's Colin Powell and there's Yo-Yo Ma playing his cello and there's Barbara Streisand and I'm sweating through a cheap suit I had bought off the clearance rack at Macy's and feeling incredibly uncomfortable. And so I walked, I sidled into this room, the side room here. And you know, look at this, this is these beautiful honey colored herringbone wood floors. And these are Paul Revere silver and Chippendale sofas and those heavy curtains that are always catching on fire in movies. And this room was empty and I walked over to where my cursor is pointing here and I put my hand on this desk and this writing desk and, and sort of exhaled. And behind me, a voice said, please don't touch that. And I said, oh, I'm sorry, is it old? And I turned around and it was a Marine guard standing there. And he said, that's the table where Benjamin Franklin signed the Treaty of Paris. And at that very moment, I thought, I didn't know Franklin did that. And secondly, what's the Treaty of Paris? And I spent the rest of the lunch feeling really stupid, sitting in a corner of this with all these dignitaries thinking, I know so much about Chinese dynasties, Chinese provinces, Chinese history and so forth. I know very little about the founding of my own country. And it got me thinking like, who is Benjamin Franklin? And what does he really, you know, what did he do and what did he accomplish? And so I went back to my hotel room and I started Googling as one does. And I didn't know that Franklin lived in London. You know, one thing that I'm sure many of you know this, and I'll just go through this introduction rather quickly before we get to the meat of his last will and testament. But it struck me, you know, something Maureen had mentioned is that Franklin and I shared something in common and that we spent much of our adult life as an expatriate. Franklin spent almost all but the last 30 years of his life, except for the five years when he came back to Philadelphia in 1785, um, overseas, both in London and in Paris. And here is a shot of his house in London, which you can visit. I'm sure many of you know this or have been there before. And I didn't know too, that when you walk inside of it, you know, most of Franklin's artifacts are gone. They have the windows here. So you can sit and look out at where he took his cold air baths. He'd sit naked in front of the windows here. But in going to this house and starting to think about Franklin, I didn't know that he was such a strong swimmer. I didn't know that once Franklin leapt from a boat in Chelsea at Blackfriar, or at near Chelsea, excuse me, and swam two miles against the tidal Thames current to Blackfriars. Um, he was inducted into the International Swimming Hall of Fame posthumously. I didn't know that Franklin had invented swim fins. I didn't know that Franklin had perfected a better catheter and an odometer. I didn't know that he had invented a glass, you know, the glass harmonica, this instrument that Mozart composed a piece for. And so the more I got into reading about Franklin and thinking about Franklin, you know, I also realized that I didn't know what his elder state of mind was and what he was doing. I think, again, a lot of us, when we learn about Franklin, it's the famous experiments or it's his statesmanship and diplomacy as a, you know, in the events leading up to the revolution. And here at that State Department room, you know, they have a figurine here of Franklin here. He's 74 years old and Louis the 16th. Uh, the king is only 24 years old in this, in this figure. And this is them signing the Treaty of Alliance in 1778, where Louis XVI you know, agrees to lend men material and money uh, to the revolutionary cause. And again, as I'm standing in the State Department, thinking about this, looking at this, and then reflecting on it later, I thought, look at how Louis XVI is dressed. Look how Franklin is dressed. Um, and I'm sweating through this ill-fitting suit, and I'm realizing, you know, Franklin should also be credited as the inventor of business casual, um, another thing we might add to his legacy. Many of us, of course, know the story of, you know, flying the kite, but again, as I started thinking about Franklin, I thought, but where did this experiment happen? Uh, it turns out it was in the Northern Liberties in Philadelphia, most likely. We don't know the exact site. Um, this photo, this, this etching, this, this illustration is apocryphal. This probably did not happen this way. They he and his younger son, uh, William here, were probably standing under a little shelter where William kept his pony. William probably held the kite string and it was Franklin who touched his knuckle to the key and felt that ecstatic joy of the shock, you know, the, the, the string, the braids of the string rising up, electrified and proving that lightning is indeed electricity. Um, so, you know, as I was thinking about Franklin and going back over this, I thought there's a Chinese proverb that goes, without coincidence, there would be no story. And I thought it's very 
telling that I walk into this room, I touch this desk, I start thinking about Franklin and touching that desk really gave me that same jolt, perhaps, that Franklin felt when he touched his knuckle to the kite string and the key. You know, I had spent so much of my time living in older Chinese cities, places that had largely eradicated their history, you know, smashed it to pieces during different you know, wars and political upheaval. But at the same time, history is very palpable when you're in China. You can see things and touch things that are hundreds of years, if not thousands of years old. And I got the sense suddenly that Franklin wasn't this man on the $100 bill. He wasn't this man that only lives in history books, but he was once a young person. Here he is, uh, uh, the one portrait we have of him, uh, depicting him when he was in his 40s. And you know that he, when you start reading his will, one thing that struck me is that he, he begins his will, I, Benjamin Franklin, printer. For all of his achievements, he starts with his trade. And Franklin, if you go back and look at his memoir, which the, the events end in 1757, he's talking to his, the, the book begins, Dear Son. It's addressed to William. And he's telling William, these are the foundations of my fortune. This is what led me to become the person I am today. And in the book, you know, he journeys back to Ecton. This is in North Hampshire, Northamptonshire, about an hour and a half north of London. You can still visit the village today, nice carving here. And in the book too, he talks to his son about, you know, our family emigrated from this little parish. His father, Josiah, was a skilled uh, dyer, cloth dyer, and ended up in Boston at a time when Boston, you know, was grazing cows and pigs on its common. And Franklin says, you know, these are the roots of our family. This is from where we began. And Franklin in the memoir goes and visits the graves of his father's uh, brother, Thomas, Franklin's uncle, and his wife, Eleanor. And another thing, I, I'm showing you this because I want to touch very briefly on two of like, why we don't know a lot about the story of Franklin's will and these remarkable bequests he made in his afterlife. And it, I think as Franklin's history gets passed down, I find that when you stare at that sagging shelf of Franklin history books, this enormous shelf, a lot of the same anecdotes are retold, a lot of the same letters are quoted. And when I started looking deep into Franklin, and this is, you know, there's a great, you can read Franklin's letters online. There's a wonderful repository that the American Philosophical Society and Yale um, and the Packard Humanities Foundation, the Institute have put together where you can sit and read through his 8,000 plus surviving items of correspondence. And as I did that, looking at, you know, beginning researching this book, a different kind of person started emerging. And so in his memoir, for example, Franklin talks about, he kind of has a, a pithy comment about, um, you know, when I visited this graveyard son of mine, he's writing to William, um, you know, I realized that I was the youngest son of the youngest son running five generations back. And if there was anyone, any chance of inheriting a fortune, no one stood less a chance than I. Um, and he's using this as a pretext, we'll see this in his will, where he explains to his kids and his heirs why I'm not leaving you all my money. I'm going to leave some money to the scheme I have proposed. But it's not until you get into Franklin's letters and start reading between the lines, the things that he you know, didn't put in his memoir, that you discover, if, for example, in a private letter to Debbie, his wife, to Deborah, he reveals that when he visited these gravestones, the stones were so covered in moss we could not read the letters until Peter, who was Franklin's slave, the enslaved man that he brought with him to London, who, quote unquote, behaves very well to me, knelt down and scoured the stones clean. And that got me thinking again, too, this is really interesting. Franklin was very astute and careful about his image and how he wanted to be presented to the public. Um, and in his memoir, he omits the fact that he owned slaves. And again, I don't want to go really deep into all of Franklin's background. I think many of you probably know that Franklin later in life came on the right side of this issue. Um, he and his family owned approximately six enslaved people, if not more, throughout their lifetimes. Franklin called them servants. They worked in his print shop. But he also brought Peter, this gentleman, with him to London. Of course, later in his life, Franklin becomes president of the Pennsylvania Society for the Abolition of Slavery and presents the first petition to abolish slavery to Congress. 
um, which was roundly rejected. But I think this is one of the first myths I hit with Franklin of like, okay, so perhaps Franklin shouldn't be considered as a self-made man, right? He had a lot of help, including benefiting from unpaid labor in his print shop. He also had a ton of help from his wife, Deborah, who had a common law marriage with Franklin. I think when you look at Franklin's biographies, you know, if we look at his life as sort of a blockbuster production, Deborah is often assigned a walk on role. She comes on the stage, um, you know, biographers often quote the same sort of letters from her. They describe her as, as um, you know, being solid and sturdy rather than beautiful and intelligent because she certainly was. And she was to the point where it's fun. In the book, I talk about how uh, Franklin in the 1730s assigned power of attorney to Deborah. In fact, the pre-printed form said, I give my friend, and then you write in a man's name, and it said he crossed out friend and wrote wife and put in Deborah's name and gave her power of attorney because she really was uh, helpful to the foundation of his fortune, not only because it was her that worked alongside him in their print shop and of course raised their children. It was Debbie, you can look at the ledgers that are held at the American Philosophical Society, who was calculating you know, trade in, in coffee and mackerel and print and so forth in different currencies, you know, in Spanish money and Mexican gold in, in South American coins, in European money and so forth. She was remarkably intelligent, great business person, um, managed their property portfolio in those years when Franklin was away. Uh, as I mentioned, there's almost 30 years that he spent overseas. And so in the book too, I take great pains in the beginning to really show the reader what Deborah's words are and how she sounded in her letters. Um, I think two biographies often say, you know, well, Debbie was afraid or she didn't want to follow Franklin to Europe. And I think we can flip that on its head. Franklin wrote that she had a, a deep aversion to crossing the sea. Um, and that was a reason because she, as a young girl, when she made the crossing from England, it was a horrible voyage um, where people died and she was quite seasick for those six to seven weeks. And so I think we can flip this a little bit too and say, if you've ever been an expatriate, you know that the trailing spouse is the often the worst role to have. And maybe Debbie, instead of wanting to go to London and Paris and being a trailing spouse, she wanted to stay in Philadelphia where she was a, you know, a very important member of the community and had her friends and had her business and had her family and had her pew at Christ Church um, and instead decided not to go. It pains me, you know, in the book, I, I admire Franklin for so many things. And like on the issue of slavery, he becomes more progressive um, and willing to change his mind as he gets older. But in, as he ages, you know, the distance with Debbie is so great um, and the relationship starts to founder. And I think Franklin, you know, often signed his letters, B. Franklin. And when I read his letters to scientists and other states people, I'm always really excited, like, yes, B. Franklin, we should all be Franklin, uh, but not in his relationship to Debbie in their later years. And in the book, I retain her spelling because it's quite painful to read, you know, when she writes to him in 1769, for example, when he's in London, um, I'm distressed that you're staying so much longer that I lost my resolution and the very dismal winter both Sally and myself lived so very lonely that I had gotten so very low a state and got into so unhappy a way that I could not sleep for a long time. And Debbie passes away of a stroke and Franklin is not there. I think he tries to make amends for this, however, in his will. And now I'm going to start talking about Franklin's death and his last will and testament. I'm going to refer back to some of these points I just made about his life and his beliefs. The American Philosophical Society holds Benjamin Franklin's will. Um, it's thrilling to view it. It's, it's in a, a red sort of embossed cover now. It's like holding a, a menu at a pricey restaurant as you're reading through it. But one of the things when I first looked at it that really struck me was Franklin's epitaph that he wrote. You know, again, for all of his achievements that he could have listed. And if you've visited Mount Vernon and George Washington's grave, if you've been to Monticello or Thomas Jefferson's grave, you know, Franklin's grave in Philadelphia is quite different than those men. Um, his epitaph, in, instead of including all of his massive achievements, he only wanted, I think, his greatest achievement listed on his tombstone. And this was the epitaph that he directed to be chiseled on that, Deb Benjamin and Deborah Franklin. Um, now let's go into his will. This is the fun part. So in 1790, um, shortly before Franklin died, Vice President John Adams writes a letter to Benjamin Rush, who was a mutual friend, you know, great Philadelphian, signer of the Declaration of Independence, father of American psychiatry, Benjamin Rush. And Adams says to Rush, 
uh, you know, he's fuming at the fact that, that Franklin and Washington are getting all the credit for the success of the revolution. And um, Adams writes that the history of our revolution will be one continued lie from one end to the other, that Franklin smote the earth with his lightning rod and outsprung you know, Washington. Now, this is a pretty off-quoted letter in Franklin biographies, but I have to say the letter continues. And to me, this is the even better part. Adams is very self-reflective and he writes to Rush, if this letter should be preserved and read a hundred years hence, the reader will say, the envy of this John Adams could not bear to think the truth. But this, my friend, to be serious, is the fate of all ages and nations. No nation can adore one, more than one man at a time. But the irony is that Franklin dies 13 days later and upon his death, Benjamin Franklin was not that man. He, you know, in his dying days, he was at odds with many of his fellow framers. He was not being repaid for his Paris expenses, his grocer's bill, his wine merchant's bill. He was fuming that he was not recognized for the service he had given in Paris and all the people like, like Lafayette and Casimir Pulaski and so forth that he had provided inter letters of introduction to the, the, to the Continental Army. Um, Franklin expected a land grant or something you know, to reward him and he was not given that. He was also very upset at how Pennsylvania had changed its constitution to go from its legislature, excuse me, so that it wasn't going to be a unicameral body anymore, but was going to be a bicameral legislature with Franklin Fume had an upper house and a lower house. And he said that seems to denigrate the lower house, you know, a direct democracy is the way to go. Uh, so Franklin was mad about those things. He was very mad at his son, William, because William, as many of you know, sided with King George in the revolution and was then in exile in, in London. He was fuming about the course that William's son Temple, Franklin's beloved grandson, was taking with his life. So he had a lot of this stuff going on um, as, he's, as he's dying. And I think the fun thing about reading anybody's will, you know, a great will tells a story of a life. And Franklin's will really tells a story because he knows it's gonna be published upon his death. And it's fun to read it and think of it as a way of score settling, if you will. And so here's the original will signature page right here. And you can still see it, this wax stamp clings precariously to it. And he wrote this will in 1788, but then in 1789, only two months after George Washington is inaugurated as the first president of the United States in New York City, Franklin remembers a promise he had made to a French writer. And Franklin adds this codicil that starts here. Three pages, fascinating to me. And as I'm reading this, you know, as I start researching this book, I start thinking, why has nobody written about this before? And you know it's time to write a book when the book you want to read doesn't exist. Now, I know biographies, the very nature of the word, bio means life, right? And that biographies end, usually with the person's death. And maybe in Franklin's case, because the writer ran out of paper, ran out of ink, um, and their family really wanted to see them again, because there's so much to write about. Poor Richard said that the worst of commentators spoil the best of books. So I don't mean to throw shade or criticize Franklin's many biographers, because it only makes sense to me that the story would end at his death. But in reading this will, it struck me, my, my family's background is, is all working class, and my, my mom and her husband work in construction. I'm the dumb one in our family because I can't read a blueprint and price a job. And so when I started reading Franklin's will, I thought, oh, this is fascinating. Franklin had a lot on his mind when he died and he wanted to make this, this bet, this promise to the working class to pay forward all the support he had been given when he was starting out as a printer in Boston. Now this wasn't his idea. There was a French essayist named Charles Mathon de la Cour, who in 1785 wanted to impress Franklin in Paris, and so sent Franklin a satiric essay called Fortunate Richard, the Testament, the Will of Fortunate Richard. And in it, uh, Franklin you know, reads this essay, and it's, it's about a man who's taught the value of compound interest. And his grandfather gives him a little bit of money and says, invest this money in the bank, let it appreciate, and after 100 years, it will have multiplied 131 times and then you can leave it in your will and do great things with it. 
And so this French writer writes to Franklin this essay and he says, you know, well, this guy, is, he did this. And then a hundred years hence, he decided to open a bunch of libraries with the money. You know, he's trying to curry Franklin's favor here. He liked libraries. And he said, then he also opened up a uh, trade school for women. So women would be paid equally for their work. And then fortunate Richard in his will decides to found a central bank of Europe. So the precursor of the Euro essentially. So it'll reduce wars in Europe. And then most importantly, he's gonna create small loans to tradespeople so they can start their own businesses and get a leg up in life. 1789, Franklin ailing in bed at Franklin Court, emaciated. Uh, he has pleurisy, he has a kidney stone, he's skeletal, he's on a steady diet of laudanum, a horrible uh, tonic called Daffy's Elixir. He's drinking lye. Uh, I mean, just he's emaciated and skeletal and remembers this essay that this French guy had written about Fortunate Richard. He says, you know what? I'm gonna try this. I'm gonna put this in my own will. And so, you know, Franklin's unique among people who founded universities, in his case, present day University of Pennsylvania, and that he did not leave any money to the college that he founded or helped found. And in fact, Franklin, before he dies, writes a letter to his would-be executor and says, you know, the college that I founded did not become what I intended. I intended the university in Pennsylvania and Philadelphia to be a great leveler of society. I wanted people to go there. I should say men, Franklin, we say he's ahead of his time, but he was very much of his time. He, his college was only open to men at that time. Um, and he said, you know, I wanted them to learn public speaking. I wanted them to learn accounting. I wanted them to learn good business practices that would be useful to raise their status. But instead, the academy has become uh, a breeding ground for the new aristocracy of blue bloods. And I think he looked around at his fellow founders and felt the same way. You know, very wealthy men who own large plantations, quote unquote, gentlemen farmers with enslaved people, or in the case of John Adams, a lawyer who also had a large estate in Massachusetts. And so Franklin says, you know what? Instead, I want to leave a bulk of money to tradespeople. And I want to take the French essay as Charles Mathon de Lacour's idea and put it in my own will. Because he said, the best apprentices make the best citizens. And his idea here is that, excuse me for a second. As a young man in Philadelphia, I mentioned Franklin was not self-made. He uh, received backing from two business people that said, we wanna stake your business and buy out your alcoholic partner. And so Franklin on his deathbed remembers this and says, okay, just like those men helped me, I wanna help the next generation of tradespeople. And so the idea of the will, what he, what he set up was, I'm gonna take 2000 pounds, which at the time was about $8,888. These, it's so hard to do historic conversions of currency. It was worth a lot. And when David Rittenhouse, he of Rittenhouse Square um, and a member of the American Philosophical Society as an astronomer, did the inventory of Franklin's estate, he found that that 2000 pounds was an enormous amount. Franklin only had a few pounds of cash in the house. Um, but that at that time, those 2000 pounds, you know, really had the purchasing power of millions. And so Franklin, um, and this by the way, is his death notice that appears in the Philadelphia Gazette. And I'm showing you this because in this notice, you'll notice how small, how short it is. It doesn't mention his will uh, and testament yet. This is just the, the announcement um, of Franklin's uh, funeral cortege from Franklin Court to the Christchurch burying ground on Arch Street, which is still there today. It doesn't mention his will and testament yet, that's coming. But Franklin in his bequest says, I'm gonna take a thousand pounds and put it in two pots, one pot in Boston, one pot in Philadelphia. This money is to be loaned to young apprentices married under age 25, okay? He had come in law, married uh, Deborah at age 24, who want to start their own businesses. They're gonna take 60 pound loans, small amount, which was enough to start its own business at the time. Um, and they're gonna repay it at below market rate, 5% interest over 10 years. This is gonna help them get their leg up on their, on their future. I hope that they then go on to public service because tradespeople interact with all classes, colors, creeds, origins every day at the street level. They see the effect of policies and taxation 
on a city and on businesses. So it's really important that they become a part of public life, unlike these men who uh, framed the constitution with me and are now ruling our country. And so, you know, we could say Franklin invented microfinance in many ways with this idea because it's gonna be small loans over a period of time. And then he said, after a hundred years, Boston and Philadelphia, you can take a portion of this money as it accrues with massive interest and you can come together and democratically decide to build something to benefit the common good. But he didn't stop there. He said, it's gonna go on for another hundred years. And on the bicentennial of my death, which in this case would be 1990, you're gonna to come together again and spend this windfall on something that will benefit the cities at large. Now, again, what struck me when I, when I look back at his death notice and look back at the will is that this was not immediately reported at the time. But when you go into the ledgers held at the American Philosophical Society and the Boston City Archives, you can start following this loan scheme, this bet, this amazing experiment that Franklin left money for in his will. This is the cover page of the ledger in Boston. You see records of the proceedings of the trustees of the legacy of 1,000 pounds bequeathed to the inhabitants of the town of Boston. Franklin was very cagey in his will. He knew that Boston and Philadelphia had a great rivalry even then. He stipulated that if one city would not accept his money, the other city got all of it. And the city fathers in both these towns might have looked at this and said, whoa, 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 whoa. Franklin wants us to manage a loan scheme for 200 years for free. We cannot accept any money from his estate for this um, and expect that after 100 years and 200 years, the money will still be there and we can then decide to come together and build something. And I love Franklin. You can kind of picture him with a twinkle in his eye after just enduring the Constitutional Convention. What is it going to be like 100 years and 200 years hence when Americans try to get together and democratically decide what to do with this money? But, you know, poor Richard said, blessed is he who expects nothing, for he shall never be disappointed. I have to say, when you open the ledgers and start reading them, it is fascinating to see who got the money and, you, and what trades got the money. Boston accepted the money first there in 1791. This is 1792. This is a notice in his grandson, Benjamin Benny's newspaper, um, trying to get people in Philadelphia to come and apply for the loan. Boston had a head start. A bricklayer named Daniel Tuttle uh, received the first Franklin loan. And Franklin, you know, the, the American financial system was so fledgling when Franklin died. The dollar was not official currency yet. It was not made so until 1792. And so Franklin said that, you know, you, you're going to get the money in pounds, but then every borrower had to have two guarantors behind them, and they're going to guarantee the money in Spanish gold to repay it. Um, so Boston also has, uh, you know, along with Daniel Tuttle, the bricklayer, they have a silversmith named Thomas Ayers. And when you look at his backer, it's none other than Paul Revere. Boston's first class of recipients could have built and, and maintained an entire village. When you're flipping through the legacy, um, you know, you see a house right, a glazier, a cabinet maker, a blacksmith, a founder, a candle maker, a saddler, a shoemaker. You just see this whole village um, assemble before you and you start pulling for them. I hope they pay the money back as you're following their progress. Philadelphia's first loan went to a shoemaker named John Grant. Um, and then they slowly but surely start attracting people to apply for the loans. You know, a sideline of his will here, too, is that Franklin is diverting money away from his family. Temple, his grandson, William, is given only his papers as a, as a way of hoping Franklin or Temple makes good. And, and does he's become a bit of a cad and a roué at that time. So in the book, I follow Frank uh, Temple and what he does with the money and why it takes him nearly 20 years to pull together Franklin's papers. Uh, he gives money, his printing press to Benny, his beloved grandson. And you could still see that print shop here today. In the book, I talk about how Benny, you know, much to my surprise, was the first American prosecuted under the Alien and Sedition Acts uh, for his vehement uh, criticism of President George Washington for continuing to own slaves in Philadelphia and his criticism of other Federalists. As Patrick mentioned in the opening, you know, uh, Benjamin gave a lot of his estate to Sally, and this is 50, his daughter Sally, this is 50 years before laws of coverture are changed in Pennsylvania. So he says in the will, 
I'm giving you this diamond encrusted portrait that Louis XVI gave me. And I'm telling your husband right now on this will, this is for you and you alone, not his use. This is your independent income. And he also left her bank shares for her independent use. You can see the diamonds are missing from this portrait. Franklin had told Sally, you cannot use the diamonds for jewelry. That's a terrible practice. So instead, she slowly started selling the diamonds in order to go overseas for the first time, uh, which I love. You know, in the book, I talk about this, how her son and her nephew and her brother got to go overseas, but Franklin never took her. Sally was left behind to take care of their, her mother, Deborah, and it managed the business. And I love finding this advertisement not long after Franklin's death. This is Sally putting an ad in Benny's newspaper saying, we're going to let out Franklin's house and I could use the money from the diamonds I'm selling and I can go over to London. And here's Deborah or Sally, excuse me, the only known portrait we have of her. I think Franklin would have been shocked at the lace she's wearing here because Franklin once told her, don't waste money on lace. You know, you say you want to buy lace and that shocked me as much as if you had put salt on my strawberries. If you want lace, just let moths eat through your cloth and they'll have holes in it. That's how I do it instead. You know, William, his son that betrayed him in the revolution received a grand total of zero. Franklin is very pointed in the will. He's the first heir to be listed. You get my most worthless lands in Nova Scotia. Uh, William was buried at old St. Pancras uh, graveyard here. This is behind King's Cross St. Pancras station in London. A young uh, architect named Thomas Hardy, later the great novelist, um, oversaw the moving of graves and you can visit the Hardy tree where they were putting the train tracks in for Pan St. Pancras Station. These tombstones were moved and William's tombstone is rumored to be somewhere around this. Benny, as I mentioned before, you know, was excoriated by the Federalists. Here we have an editorial cartoon where people are attacking Benny, calling him the bastard child of Franklin. His nickname was Lightning Rod Jr. Uh, here's Lady Liberty weeping over a portrait of Franklin. This is in the Federal Gazette in the 1790s. And as I mentioned, Benny is prosecuted under the Alien and Sedition Acts, but ends up um, dying of uh, yellow fever in 1798. But his wife, Peggy Margaret Hartman, uh, continued their newspaper and Thomas Jefferson credited her newspaper as helping him to win the presidency. And I wanna go back quickly. I have about 10 more minutes where I wanna talk about the fate of his bequests. You know, when you look at the ledgers at the American Philosophical Society, the Philadelphia ledgers, you see this is, these are pre-printed forms that Benny printed at the print shop there um, at Franklin Court. And the names are wonderful. Look, this is a silversmith whose name is Liberty Brown. Uh, he was born on the 4th of July. Um, and then you can see recorded here in the ledger when these payments were made. And does Liberty in fact pay back the loan? Liberty was you know, the embodiment of the Franklin ideal. Um, he became elected as president of Philadelphia City Council um, and had a long life in politics. And you can still see his silver for sale on auction sites. Philadelphia and Boston really diverged in how they managed Franklin's funds. You know, Boston was a parochial town known for its academies and its churches. Philadelphia was a port known for its diverse population. And of course, it was the capital center of banking, center of publishing, and center of industry at that time in the 1800s. And I think this embodies it really well. This is a, a man named Pat Lyon who um, had been wrongly imprisoned during the yellow fever epidemic that killed Benny, received a settlement. Um, he put the Walnut Street Jail here in the background of his portrait. He's wearing a leather apron. Franklin wanted his money to benefit the leather apron class. And although Pat Lyon became quite wealthy because he started selling fire wagons to fight fires, um, he said, I wanna be painted like this. I wanna be shown like this. And the mayor of Philadelphia at this time was Robert Wharton. Wharton was an apprentice as a hatter and had a decided distaste for learning. He was elected 16 times, he served 14. And under Wharton, you know, Philadelphia and people like Pat Lyon really endeavored to make sure Franklin's money was being lent to working class people. Maybe it wasn't a good idea though, because Franklin didn't factor into the, the equation that people might default on their loans. He also didn't foresee the industrial revolution. Three years after he dies, a man named Eli Whitney files a patent for the cotton gin. Um, Franklin doesn't foresee the opening of the Erie Canal, which takes a lot of business away from Philadelphia and from its skilled tradespeople. He also didn't foresee the rise of a man named Nathaniel Bowditch. This is Bowditch's tombstone up in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Bowditch is very much a man cut from Franklinian cloth. He 
made his living, you know, as an apprentice and then at sea and as a writer, taking people's ideas and making them better. He improved the new practical navigator, um, which is still on American ships today. But Bowditch in the 1800s starts working for an insurance company. And although he's a wonderful writer, and in the book I said, you know, this is kind of like Jane Austen going to write greeting cards. He was the, her contemporary. But Bowditch liked working for this insurance company because he had a real head for numbers. And Bowditch invents what becomes America's first investment bank. And the uh, textile magnet, uh, Charles Lowell says, you know, we have something in Boston now that is better than any institution in the world. It's a savings bank for the wealthy. And so in the 1800s, people like Bowditch are inventing in financial instruments that Franklin could not foresee. Investment banks, mutual funds, and the stock market is starting to really have its rise and plummeting fall and rise again in the 1800s. And in Boston, the managers of Franklin's money decide, let's focus on the end product and the payout in the centennial and bicentennial, uh, bicentennial of his death, excuse me. And so unlike Philadelphia in Boston, they start putting his money behind closed bank vaults, essentially. They don't lend it to working class people. Philadelphia and Boston in the 1800s have a real contention back and forth about Franklin's legacy. In the book, I talk about how every generation of Franklin or every generation of Americans, excuse me, discovers Franklin for themselves. Our view of Franklin kept changing based on the times. I think Franklin, I think of him as like a, a work of art. He doesn't change, but the way we see him changes and the things we like about him and the flaws we see in him. Philadelphia in the 1800s is so proud of its Franklin loan scheme. It starts realizing, hey, you know, people are interested in Franklin and we could draw tourists to his grave. And so in the 1850s, they open up the wall of the Christchurch burial ground here. Um, and you can see through the fences of his grave. In Boston, I have five more minutes and I'll go through this rather quickly. Thank you for your patience, by the way, everyone. In Boston, you know, there's a man named Samuel McCleary who finally comes onto the scene in the 1870s and says, what is going on with Franklin's money? He expected us to be lending this to working class people. McCleary becomes very important in this story because here he is when he takes over the management of Boston's fund. Here he is when he retires from managing Franklin's fund. I mean, he spent that much time with it and he really tries to correct course. Philadelphia, meanwhile, invests its money in a bunch of harebrained schemes. And as, as Philadelphia's government sort of started falling into a Tammany Hall sort of pit of vice and, and um, bribery and so forth, Franklin's descendants come onto the scene 100 years later, inclu including Elizabeth Duane Gillespie here, who was a leading Philadelphia feminist, who said, in Franklin's will, in my, in my great grandfather's will, it says that if you don't manage this loan scheme correctly, the money goes to his heirs. And so we want the money instead. Thus begins about 40 year period of litigation. And Gillespie hires a young Wharton graduate named um, George Wharton Pepper to start fighting these lawsuits to try to get Franklin's money back to the heirs so they can manage it instead. Pepper is an interesting story, uh, character in the story to me because he also stays with Franklin's money for a 40 year period. And I'll come back to him in a second. Boston, meanwhile, starts thinking like, okay, we have to spend the money. What should we do with it? And it realizes that the way it was managed is not going to be enough to do what it wants to do with the money. They wanna build a trade school. And so they enlist the help of this young man who becomes this old man. And Andrew Carnegie, at a speech at the American Philosophical Society marking the anniversary of Franklin's death in front of Elizabeth Duane Gillespie and a bunch of dignitaries, after three days of speeches says, all of you got Franklin completely wrong. None of you have mentioned his philanthropy. None of you has mentioned his gift to the working class. And I, in my own philanthropy, take my lessons from Franklin. He says to the assembled crowd, take your theology from Franklin. We should all be his disciples. I'm making a claim on the behalf of my greatest teacher, Benjamin Franklin. Of course, Carnegie opens libraries, right? That's the first thing he does with his philanthropy. But Carnegie especially liked Franklin's invention of the matching grant, which Franklin had used to help found the Pennsylvania hospital. And so Carnegie steps forward and says, let's build something with Franklin's money at the centennial of his death. And I think uniquely, Carnegie did not add his name to the Benjamin Franklin Trade School, which is now the Benjamin Franklin Institute of Technology. Franklin, Carnegie loved lending his name to everything he gave money to, 
which is really different than Franklin. You know, you Philadelphians know that you could be at the Philadelphia, you could be at the, the Franklin, we could be at the Franklin Philosophical Society right now. We could be at the Frank, you know, walk by the Franklin Fire Brigade, walk by the Franklin Hospital, walk by the Franklin University. Franklin felt that you should not put your money and your, your name on your philanthropy because otherwise people won't give to your cause. You should keep yourself out of sight as much as possible. You know, and quickly here, I wanna go into the 20th century and then I'm gonna take questions. Give me three more minutes. In the 1920s, you know, people like Jay Gatsby sort of become the laughing stock um, vision, or I should say the forward facing notion of what Franklin was. You know, he becomes this sort of paragon of thrift in the American imagination, this conservative person, which is so unlike, you know, a man who had a son out of wedlock, married Deborah common law, a uh, common law marriage, and then devoted himself to so much philanthropy and, uh, you know, gave him his dying wish to the working class and wanted their survival in American society. In the great Gatsby, you know, at Gatsby's funeral, Gatsby's father shows Nick, um, you know, it, when Gatsby was a young man, he kept a very Franklinian schedule. You know, he'd start his day. What good will I do today and end the day? What good have I done today? And he'd say, I must study electricity. I must study needed inventions and so forth. Um, it's really, really different. And, you know, I mentioned George Wharton Pepper earlier, the man in the gladiator costume who fought these legal battles for Franklin's money in Philadelphia. We can thank Pepper for raising the money to get the Franklin Institute built. Um, they needed a matching grant, and it took them 40 years nearly to have this institute built. And Pepper stepped forward as an older man and raised $5 million in 12 days. Um, and we, he dedicated the Franklin Memorial here, this statue that you see inside the Franklin Institute. I think it's odd, though, when you go to the Franklin Institute, you don't see mention of George Wharton Pepper except at this, this uh, room upstairs that's available to rent for functions and receptions. Um, it said on the website, it says this room has a lot of historical significance, but the website doesn't tell us what that significance is or what George Wharton Pepper did. Throughout the 20th century, other Philadelphians and Pennsylvanians start stepping forward with new ideas. In the book, I talk about this gentleman, Walter Lyon, who as a young man escapes Nazi Germany, flees Berlin, literally, uh, and gets, makes his way to a transit ship, ends up in America and starts working for the Philadelphia a public health bureau and then the Pennsylvania Public Health Bureau, 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, he's so inspired by Franklin. He says, I wanna get this money and use it to start a, a natural resources museum in Pennsylvania so we can document people like Rachel Carson who have done so much to protect our environment. He's really ahead of his time. And again, I'm gonna close now and take questions. I, I find it odd when I walk around Philadelphia today, you don't see markers of men such as Walter Lyon. You don't see when you go to the Franklin Memorial, the plaques around his statue say citizen and they say scientist, but they don't really mention his philanthropy and they certainly don't mention Franklin's dying bet to the working class. You can still see this you know, in person. Uh, you can walk into the Franklin Institute of Technology and I spend time in the book watching classes, watching young people, many of whom are first generation immigrants like Franklin was, um, learning trades, learning skilled labor. And I said to the, the, the president of the school, what about the fourth industrial revolution? What about robotics? He said, we're not worried about it. Yes, robots are taking over jobs, but we're the ones fixing the robots. He said, we're, we're trying to raise um, the new middle class in America and train young people to learn trades. And in America, this is a revolutionary act at the moment. So uh, this is the end of Franklin's will, which is also the end of my talk. And I'm just gonna show you a couple images because at the end of the book, I imagine what would Franklin make if he came back to America today? If he landed at the Delaware River Wharf where he disembarked, I think he'd probably be really shocked to see his face here on the side of a bus. I think he'd be shocked to see his name on so many businesses as you walk up Market Street. Market Street still has the same footprint, by the way, still wide enough for a horse and carriage to make a U-turn in. I think he'd be shocked and probably pleased to see that the entrance to Franklin Court still exists in its original state. Maybe he'd be a little stunned that his house was pulled down by his descendants in the early 1800s. Um, and now when you go there, you see this ghostly outline of what was. I think he'd probably be a little confused at the t-shirts you can buy around his museum, such as this one. Um, and I think he'd be very curious about the state of our democracy and what, um, how we're solving problems today. 
And then last but not least, I think he'd be really pleased and, and honored and flattered, frankly, because he cared about his image a great deal at the crowds of people that go on the other side of the bars to look at he and Deborah's grave and toss pennies onto it. Now, the caretaker of the cemetery told me these pennies are very abrasive. No one ever tosses less abrasive $100 bills. <laughs> they get pennies instead. Um, but you know, it's, it's interesting to sit on the bench in that cemetery in Christ Church Cemetery and watch people, this parade of people from all over the world, all walks of life come and give an offering at Franklin's grave. It's like a shrine, it's a connection they're making. Um, and I think Franklin would be shocked to see today that you know, more nonprofits employ more people than manufacturing and the trades do in America. He'd be shocked at that. Uh, he might also be pleased in a weird way. But I think the, the, the biggest thing, and I'll end on this thought, is that he'd be stunned that half, in, half of Americans identify as working class, but less than 2% of Congress have ever held a working class job. And I think he'd really wonder, did my bet go so astray that although we still have the trades that were the first recipients of my loans working in America today, we don't, the working class and skilled tradespeople don't have a voice in our representative democracy. And that would probably sadden him a great deal. So I urge you all to pick up Benjamin Franklin's last bet from your library or your favorite bookseller. And I'm happy to stop there and take any questions you might have. Thanks for listening. Great, thank you, Michael. Um, and I don't know if you can stop uh, the share. Sure. Uh, and uh, we've got a number of questions. Uh, I want to actually start. Uh, the first one comes from Annie Westcott, who's the director of meetings here at the American Philosophical Society. And she's wondering if you could talk a little bit more, uh, more about who could access uh, these loans. Um, and if I remember correctly, in the beginning, access really was limited to men, uh, white men, but she was wondering if over time, if women were able to have access or free blacks, could you talk a little bit more about that? Excellent question. Franklin didn't put a color line in his will, and this was rare at the time, um, unlike Stephen Girard, who made Girard College, which was only allowed for white male orphans to attend it, for example, long court battle in Philadelphia that went into the 1950s. Franklin didn't put those distinction. He said, uh, under age 25, married, apprenticeship finished in Boston or Philadelphia, men, men because two men had given him the loans. But it's an excellent question because over time, people such as Elizabeth Duane Gillespie, his descendant, and George Wharton Pepper loosened those restrictions on his will. Uh, so in the 1910s, for example, women could receive loans for the first time. Um, they broadened, and Philadelphia was really leading on this much more so than Boston. They broadened it to be to the trades as well. That let's say you're working in the defense industry during World War II, that's a sort of trade, right? You could receive loans. Um, you eventually, the loans were expanded to dentists, doctors, nurses in Boston, especially. In Philadelphia, I mean, the American Philosophical Society's librarian, Roy Goodman, uh, emeritus, I should add, famously received one of these loans because in the 1940s and 50s, Philadelphia started saying, you know, Franklin really wanted us to have our own businesses. That's his idea of the American dream. But after World War II, the idea of the American dream is owning your own house. And so they expanded the loan access to back mortgages from people that otherwise couldn't get them from banks. And so Roy Goodman, uh, APS librarian emeritus, was one of the recipients of those loans. And those loans allowed police, police firefighters, nurses and doctors and so forth to live in central Philadelphia, closer to the communities. Great. A uh, couple of questions that deal with the uh, what happened to the funds in, uh, after 200 years. Rob Kettle wants to know how much were actually in the Boston, Philadelphia uh, funds approximately. And Al uh, Cavallari wants to know, you know, do those funds exist in any uh, manner still today? They both do. So it's funny, like Franklin thought it'd be 17 million finishing line for both of them. Boston came pretty close, close to 15 million. Philadelphia, about a third less than that, or actually two thirds less than that, around 5 million. The fact that even a penny remained is a victory, I think. And when you look at the stories and how this, you know, all the changes and the wars and so forth that went through and the revolutions of finance are remarkable. But yeah, you can still, you can donate. If you go to the Philadelphia Foundation's website, you can click on the Benjamin Franklin Fund and donate to that fund. And in fact, I'm donating my honorarium for this very talk to this fund. Um, to, we can mingle our money with Franklin's. Um, and you can, those funds fund, uh, are back, 
young Pennsylvanians who don't want to pursue a four-year college degree, but instead want to learn a skilled trade or a craft. The judge expanded the definition to a craft or some sort of skilled artisanry. Um, in Boston, the money is still circulating at that Franklin Trade School, which is selling its historic campus, building a brand new one in Roxbury, much closer to the community where most of its um, students come from. It, and, and so you can still walk in there and see Franklin's money being used today. It's still out there. In other words, Franklin is still with us today. Great, thanks. A question from David Maxey, who is published uh, in the APS Press, uh, worked on the American Revolution himself and is an attorney uh, by training. Uh, he, he wanted to know, Franklin writing his will, did he have any legal advice or is that something that he took on himself and who are his executors? It's a great question. Franklin famously hated lawyers <laughs> long before John Adams entered his life. Um, you know, a, what, a farmer between two lawyers is a, like a cat between or a fish between two cats. You know, there's several comments about this in the book. I, I think I wanted to say that Franklin wrote the first lawyer jokes, but it turns out lawyer jokes go back to the 1600s in England as well. He did not have legal advice famously when he did this. And maybe someone if he did, someone would have said, hey, Benjamin, maybe bad idea with the money here. Let's put some 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 restrictions on this or, or see it through his executors. Um, that's a really good question. The name is escaping me right now. And I, I, darn it, it's, it's in the book, I have to say, because you can visit the man's house. He was a wine merchant. It's a very famous house in Society Hill. Uh, I don't have the book with me or I'd look him up in the index, but I want to say Fox. It wasn't Fox though. Sorry, I'll look that up. That's a great question. But there was someone, a friend of his that, that was his executor and had to deal with, when you look at the papers at the APS, had to deal with all these complaints, like Temple is not sharing the papers with the cousin he's supposed to. And the Pennsylvania hospital does not want this ledger of Franklin's debts that he gave to them and said, go track down the borrowers and you can have the money. You know, the executor was really put out um, with, his, with Franklin's bequests. Yeah. The foxes are how we got the papers at the APS actually. Oh, that's um, probably the right name then, good, okay. Um, uh, but uh, I think maybe a physic, does that sound right? Say again? Was it physic? I don't know. Or maybe it's false. But in any case, we, we have time for, I think, two more questions that I have my own that I've been kind of holding yeah, go ahead. to. So the next one's from uh, Larry Tice. Um, and he wants to know if you could talk a little bit more about uh, the centennial bequest and the creation of the Franklin Institute uh, in both Boston and Philadelphia. Um, can you just explain how that bequest actually happened and the decision behind it? Oh, it's a great question. I have to say it's a, it's a long portion of the book <laughs> because, because really the, it was fascinating to me looking back. It was a real big deal in both Boston and Philadelphia, national media, contentious public hearings. Unions in Boston did not want to trade school. They did not want to flood the market with skilled labor that might lower their own wages. Uh, Philadelphia wanted to build a girls, a girls school originally. Uh, that was certainly the Elizabeth Dwayne Gillespie's backing and Agnes Irwin, another Franklin descendant who became the first Dean of Radcliffe College. Long fights back and forth about who was gonna fund this. And in Boston, I thought what was interesting is that, you know, when Boston finally agreed to do the trade school after Carnegie signs on and says, I'll help, I'll match Franklin is his famous quote. The Boston city treasurer refused to release the money. He said, no, 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 you don't get it. Franklin gave this to us as a one-off gift. If you're building a school, taxpayers have to maintain that school. Every year there's gonna be operating expenses. Every year there's gonna be salaries. And it's really redolent of all the cities that rejected Carnegie libraries. I mean, as a Pittsburgh citizen, I still have a levy on my tax bill every year for the library, right? Because we have to pay for its maintenance. Um, and so again, I find it fascinating in the book. I spend a great deal of time on this, looking at it both from a financial point of view, like what you have to be careful about when you leave bequests to people, you don't want to burden them, but also from a political and socioeconomic point of view, what these cities were arguing about and how they were so different and what they felt was important. And it really was, Philadelphia came around to the Franklin Institute, I think because A, the Franklin Institute had really good lobbyists who said, this is important to us, we need a big science museum. But then there was all these fights about the architecture for it. You know, George Wharton Pepper, very Philly fatalist at the end was like, well, the architect had a chance to do an excellent job and he did a good one. You know, he wasn't really happy with this neoclassical facade they put on it in front of Benjamin Franklin Parkway. But again, even the building site for that changed several times in Philadelphia as they argued about it. It's an excellent question and I don't want to dodge it further than to say there's 50 pages in the book all about this. Okay. So David Maxey has answered the executor question. I think it's Henry Hill. Um, yes, that's correct. Thank you. You can visit the Hill House. Thank you. Excellent. Yes. Uh, so uh, one last question for the audience, and then I, if we have time, my, my own, uh, sure. from Rick H Heyman, uh, which I think is going to have a, 
Or Hyman, we're just going to have a great, uh, it's an interesting question. I'm interested to see how you answer it. If Franklin wanted a competition between Boston and Philadelphia, who would you say won? It's a fantastic question. And I, I hesitate. I don't want to spoil the ending. And I'm not just saying this because I'm speaking at the American Philosophical Society. Mm-hmm. Philly won. And so, you know, if you look at the final sum total, of course, Boston won. And the press reported it as if it were the pennant race, you know, between the Philadelphia Quakers, which was the baseball team at the time, and the Boston Bean Eaters. Um, But really, you know, outside of the final total, I think when you look holistically at how many people receive loans, the type of people who receive loans, what those loans were used for, how many people entered public service because of it, Philadelphia won. And, you know, even though they're, the ledgers are filled with defaulters whose, you know, names are like Franklin Penn names, you know, John Death, Francis Hammer, Fraser K. Work, Isaac Kite, Samuel Stackhouse, these fantastic names. Even when I look genealogically at those men, what happened to them after the fact, you know, that they defaulted, they all seem to land on their feet, becoming toy makers, um, you know, becoming carpenters in Philadelphia and so forth. And so I think we can say Philadelphia won. And I have to say, that's one of the things I really took from your book is anecdotally, what I had always heard was what you said, which was Boston kept the money, it grew to a much larger amount and Philadelphia kind of squandered it. But I think what your book shows is it's kind of the opposite. Um, that Philadelphia really uh, was more innovative and did more with it. Um, so last question, uh, look, thinking back on, you know, studying this 200 year experiment, do you have any lessons for philanthropy and philanthropists today um, that, that you, know, you glean from studying this, this experiment? Excellent question. And you know, the answer is really a little goes a long way. Um, I think today, major donations are the ones that make headlines and maybe we're a bit immured to it. You know, it's like oh, 12 million for a chair at Harvard, you know, 6 million for an Ottoman, whatever you want to say. Um, but Franklin, you know, bet, although it was a sizable chunk of money in his time, you know, the, at the end of the day, it's really heartening to me when you look at how his money is still being used in Pennsylvania, for example, it's still circulating in these county foundations. And you can go to the Bucks County Foundation website, the Beaver County Foundation website and stuff, and you see the managers of the money saying, you know, for us, a $20 check goes a long way. A $100 check goes a long way. We can add it to the fund. The fund can fund, you know, provide a scholarship for a high school student who wants to learn a trade. And this is exactly what Franklin wrote in his memoir that, Every, you know, he, he watched itinerant preachers, like as George Whitfield, for example, would come to Philadelphia. And it wasn't, he, he, Franklin was really struck by the fact that those with the least money were often the most charitable. Um, and I think that's certainly true in America today. Those with lowest incomes give the highest percentage of their income. But also he would watch this itinerant preacher and he'd say, you know, it's interesting. People aren't handing in paper currency. They're getting coin, coin, coin in the hat. And that adds up to a windfall over time. Um, and so I think that's the first lesson I would have is I would, I would never tell someone like when your public radio station or your favorite library or your favorite philosophical society mm-hmm. says, you know, a little goes a long way. They mean it. A $20 gift, a $50 gift, a $100 gift helps. Everything a little bit helps. So that's the first thing. The second thing I'd say is I love the forward, the foresight. I don't know how many philanthropists today are thinking of the year 2,222. And I know we could argue that, well, Franklin really did this because he wanted his name to remain in headlines. He wanted to settle scores with the founders he hated. He wanted to ensure that it was his vision of America that stayed in the news 100 and 200 years past. But I find that philanthropy in America today is often targeting the, what ails uh, an, an object right, or, a, or a community rather than trying to get at the root cause of, of what, what is causing that to happen. Um, And I like that Franklin said, rather than saying, I'm going to give money and people can, you know, we're going to build a foundry with it, or we're going to build a printing press that people could use. He said, no, it's your responsibility. I'm going to give you a little bit. You're responsible to pay it back. It's going to mean more to you this way. And again, he took the long view. This wasn't a one-off gift. It was a 10-year loan being paid off, you know, accruing principal 100 years and 200 years hence. So I, I like that idea. I think when I think of my own estate, (laughs) <laughs> for what it's worth. I'm also the youngest son of the youngest son dating five generations or so back. Um, I like this idea rather than leaving a one-off gift of leaving something with a long duration to it that pays out over time. Great. Well, thank you again, Michael. And I encourage everybody to buy this book. It was a wonderful read and really a new perspective on Franklin. So thank you again for having the APS host your book launch and 
best of luck to you. And, and thank you all for uh, zooming in uh, for this session. I appreciate it. Bye, everybody.